I'm not be shaken 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here with you again, to be able to uh, worship together and to share God's message with you. For the past few messages, we have been focusing on how we should live in response to the great love the Father has, has given to us and he has for us and the commands he has given. Everything must be based on love for him and for each other. And we have looked at his command to love, to repent, and to forgive. Today, we will consider how this takes place within the home. So I've given the message the title, Restoring the Family. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love you have for us and how you pour your love into our hearts and how we are able to love others. We're able to repent when we discover how the pain we have caused to others or when we sin against you. And we've also learned, Lord, the value of forgiving someone because we know what it's like to be forgiven by you. So as we consider now how this looks in our families, in our daily life, we pray, Father, that you will speak to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. It had been a, a long day that went late into the evening. I finally arrived home close to 11 p.m., tired, only to discover that the porch door was locked from the inside. I stood there for a few minutes trying to come to terms with being locked out of my own house. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, so I proceeded to ring the doorbell, having every intent to wake up someone so that I could get in. And after what seemed like an eternity, a light went on, and my wife finally opened the front door and then the porch door. She immediately apologized for locking me out. Now, I was relieved to hear that I was not in her bad books. But she and our girls had been afraid when earlier they'd heard a strange noise outside and, and felt afraid. So after locking and checking every window and door, they went to bed and forgot to unlock the porch door. Now, there are other homes, however, where husbands, wives, or children are purposely locked from their homes, locked out. Maybe you are from a home where after day of working with strangers, where colleagues, you do not want to go home because of the pain that's waiting there for you. I hope not for your sake and for that of your family. However, it is not an overstatement to say that in our society, many families are in serious trouble. I have been in too many homes where there are great problems. While your home may not be in crises, maybe fewer people than you think will say that they're actually happy with their spouse or even their children, or their parents. Too many simply put up with a situation they feel cannot be changed. Others consider leaving, but they cannot do so because of financial reasons. They cannot afford to live alone, especially in today's economic climate and high house prices. Others stay together just for the sake of the children, but barely tolerate each other. Now, it does not end there. When a marriage is shaky, then the troubles are often the rise in raising children are multiplied. The result is that the entire family is in trouble. Too many children are estranged from their parents. Children, for one reason or another, have been kicked out of the house, sometimes when they really need the help and support of their family. Some parents don't even know where their children are 
or if they're alive. Some children have been so scarred by the actions of their parents. And some parents are deeply hurt by their children. Some siblings have not spoken with each other for decades. To see families in such a state was never God's plan. And often we have no idea what's going on behind the front doors of homes. So even in church, we see people smiling, uh, appearing that they have it all together. But if we could see beyond the smiles and niceness, we'd see their pain and their misery. Maybe this has been your experience or you are currently living it. However, nothing is new. Families are experiencing what they have always gone through for thousands of years. In the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, the prophet spoke of a time when Elijah, the great prophet of God, would return and restore families and renew them. You see, 500 years earlier, Elijah had stood against the wicked king Ahab, who along with his wife Jezebel had led the whole nation of ancient Israel away from God and into idolatry and gross evil. Now Elijah, after a great showdown between God's power and the force of evil, had led the people back to God, restoring the nation to their rightful place before him. He had led them to a great renewal of hope and trust in God and to prosperity. So the prophet Malachi now prophesied that a time was coming when Elijah would once again appear before the great day of the Lord to restore families, bring about forgiveness, heal brokenness, renew relationships, and create an atmosphere where love peace, kindness, and goodness could be experienced by every family. And if your family is in need of this renewal, this restoration, then this prophecy is for you and for your family and for you to know that the great God of heaven has seen your distress. He has heard your prayers and he wants to give you hope and an opportunity of finding the joy and love in renewed relationships. I think for many years, following this great prophecies, uh, this great prophecy, families struggling under the onslaught of the devil and his evil angels looked for Elijah himself to make an appearance from heaven. Every generation longed for him, but it wasn't until John the Baptist, the prophet whom Jesus called the greatest of all prophets, that their hopes and dreams were realized. In Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we find the angel Gabriel appearing to Zechariah the priest, telling him how his wife would give birth to a son who must be called John. The angel said he would be great, and I quote, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And verse 17, And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And as you read a passage, you discover that in the life of John, he did just that. He preached a gospel of repentance and turning back to God. John prepared the way for Jesus to begin his great ministry when all people 
could experience the saving power of God and find deliverance from sin and restoration from the trials, tribulations, disease, and death brought on by sin. I want you to see something very important here. The angel Gabriel said that the first thing John would do in this great renewal would be to bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Bringing back the people to the Lord their God was the first step in restoring families. Now, over the years, as I have worked with many couples and relationships of all types, most people simply want me to help them fix the other person. You see, the fault is always the other person. If I could find the right tool to fix him or her, then peace or happiness could be restored. Yes, I can give them plenty of tools and help them with some practical skills for successful relationships, but they won't fix anyone unless the underlying problem is resolved. And I'm telling you that the root problem is usually a spiritual one. Okay, I know that there are some people who are immediately going to disagree with me. And that's fine. No one ever needs to agree with me. All I ask is that you consider what I'm sharing. Let me explain what I mean. We often expect that because someone has been baptized, regularly attends church services, and is very active in the life and mission of the church. In such a marriage or in such a family, there wouldn't be any of these problems. Such a marriage or family would be exemplary, wouldn't it? Well, in a Christian home where people practice their faith, abiding by the rules and laws does not always mean they are turned to God. In the time of Jesus, the religious leaders were very strict in their religious practices and duty to God. But these men still set out to murder Jesus because they saw him as a problem. They were willing to lie, cheat, break their own regulations, and falsely accuse in order to see him put to death, thinking they were doing a good thing. Many atrocities, even genocide, have been committed by people who first went to church to pray and then went out to kill other people. Understand that being religious does not mean that we are spiritual people. Religious people are led by rules and regulations. Spiritual people are led by the Holy Spirit. Religious people are usually converted to a system of beliefs or simply grow up in a culture of church as a way of life. Spiritual people are converted to Jesus the Messiah. Religious people place themselves first and tend to be proud of their achievements while they're doing those religious things, thinking that they are pleasing God. Spiritual people are humble, constantly seeking to submit to Jesus as their master and savior, seeking to follow him in all things, especially in how he treats people. I think you can see a little of what I mean when I say it is a spiritual problem. Now, it's not strange to argue or fight at home or even to feel resentment, uh, res resentful rather, or bitter towards a family member. But as soon as we arrive at church building, uh, we are smiling with everyone and we are ready to, to participate in the worship service. So at home, you're fighting, you get to church, you're happy. It's a spiritual problem. Even for those who are striving to be spiritual people and not simply being religious, we all experience what Paul describes in Romans 7 verse 19, where he says, For I do not do the good I want to do, 
but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Paul speaks of the battle within us. The battle that rages, where sin sometimes rears up its ugly head and we find ourselves behaving in ways that not only greatly dishonor the Lord our God, but negatively impacts our relationships in our families. However, the big difference between the religious, per the religious person and the spiritual person is often seen in attitude displayed when confronted with the wrong of family members or if an offense has been caused. The religious person usually adopts the moral high ground, quick to tell you that he or she stands for principle and, and seeks to uphold right, noting that the guilty must bear the consequence of their sin. They value the rules more than anything else. That is a religious person. The spiritual person also values the rules, but places more value on God's creation. He or she understands that people are more valuable to God than anything else. Understand this, God values you more than anything else. The spiritual person, therefore, recognizes and accepts that. And this is why Jesus died on the cross, to save people, to save you and me. Everything else was secondary. Now, I recognize the brother as a spiritual man. He does not mind me sharing this, so I will. He and his family were active in their local church and well-respected. I was new to the church, and upon my first <coughs> excuse me, visit to the home, he and his wife were heartbroken because their daughter, who was still in high school, had sadly become pregnant. Now, you have heard of situations like this before. She was also present when I visited. He informed me that he was going to put her out of the home because of the shame she had brought on him and on the family. He had to stand up for principle and show his great displeasure. She had made her bed and now she had to lie in it. Did I say he was a spiritual man? At that moment, I did not recognize him as spiritual. It came later. His wife had implored him to allow their daughter to remain, but he was adamant. I asked him if he loved his daughter. He replied that he did. I asked him then that if by putting her out at a time when she needed all the help and support of her family, was he showing her his love? He remained silent. Now, some people would at this time respond by saying, well, pastor, this is tough love. No, we must never confuse a harsh spirit or unforgiving heart with tough love. While the following are not the exact words used, they describe what happened. I asked him, when you sin, does Jesus push you away from him? He replied, no, he forgives me. So I followed up. Yes, and he renews his relationship with you and treats you as if you have not done any wrong. By this time, tears were just running down his wife's cheeks because she could sense his change in attitude. He solemnly nodded his head. I added, yes, right now you feel shame because you're thinking of what other people are thinking about you, but you're not thinking about your daughter. When we sin, we shame God, and we give the devil an excuse to accuse him. But our Savior does not consider the shame against his name. He considers our great need for love and makes our salvation his primary consideration. 
the brother looked at his precious daughter with love in his eyes and told her that their home was her home and that she belonged with them. You can just imagine the tears and the joy as a family embraced, and they did. Many years later, they remain a close, loving family. <clears throat> he was a spiritual man who in a moment had allowed the sinful flesh to emerge and cause him to think only of himself. However, when his thoughts went to his Savior, because he understood and accepted the grace of God, knowing that he could never do enough to put him in favor with God or earn God's consideration. He knew then he had to treat his daughter in the same way Jesus treats him. He could do no less. To do otherwise would be a rejection of God's grace towards him. For the spiritual person, Jesus is always the reference point for how we live and operate as families. Do you see what I mean about the fundamental problem being a spiritual one? The Apostle Paul, who understood what it means to be converted and to have Jesus as the center of his reference, drew the startling comparison of human relationships with that of Jesus and his church. In Ephesians 5, 25 forwards, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he writes, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy. Here is the measure, my friends, of the spiritual husband. He loves his wife just as Christ loved the church to the extent of giving him himself up for her. That is the spiritual man. Unfortunately, too many men are busy focusing on verses 22 and 24 about wives submitting themselves to their husbands. These are verses that have nothing to do with men. They don't pertain to you, husbands. Leave the wives to focus on their responsibilities. Men, you are to focus on verses 25 onwards, on your responsibility to love in the same way and to the same extent as Jesus loved the church. And just look, look at the depth and extent of his love to the point of being humiliated spat on, whipped, and abused in grievous and unspeakable ways before being nailed and naked to a cross to be a spectacle and for those passing by to hurl their insults and scorn. This is the measure of the spiritual husband, the measure of the man who aspires to be a husband. And dare we say, the measure by which a wife should also operate when we think of the principle of love involved. Now we can say this because Jesus himself says that to keep the commandments of God, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul, our total being. And we are to love our neighbors with the same depth of love that we have for ourselves. The same quality of love we have for the Lord our God. It is a love that seeks the good of the other person, not that of ourselves. It is a love that seeks to give and not receive. It is other-centered, not self-centered. When this kind of love exists within a family, you cannot tolerate any experience or any atmosphere where the relationship has been soured. It does not leave you silent and sulking for days where no words of warmth or care are expressed between husband and wife or between parents and children. No, what this kind of love does is when confronted with a misunderstanding or something said in anger or something goes wrong because of a thoughtless action, 
it immediately moves to correct the problem and find healing and restoration of the relationship. Our Father in heaven could not remain content with the separation sin had caused. And so he sent his son to die on Calvary to save us and restore us to him, to bring us back into the right relationship with him. In the same way, because we gladly accept what God has done for us, then as spiritual people, we cannot remain content with anything less than a love and relationship in our homes. Whether we are in the right or the wrong, like Jesus, we become humble for the sake of restoration and renewal. Like Jesus, we are quick to forgive. And if our words or actions have caused pain, we immediately repent and quickly seek forgiveness. We don't look to blame, but instead take responsibility for our actions, for our contribution to a problem. Allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to the other persons involved, for them to take responsibility for their actions. This is the attitude of a spiritual person. This is the attitude of someone who repents. The attitude of someone who is quick to forgive. Can you imagine a family of spiritual people? Can you imagine their home? Can you imagine what your home could be like if you were a spiritual person? Someone led by the Holy Spirit in all areas of your life, but especially in how you relate to your siblings, to your parents, your children, and your spouse? Now, I recognize my inadequacies. So every day, I pray that God will bring about this great transformation in my own life. I daily call on the Holy Spirit to fill me with his presence and direct my thoughts, my hands, and my feet. And I know that he is doing his work in my life because it is now much easier for me that now than it, it was before to tell my wife that I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit makes me feel very uncomfortable if I allow a negative atmosphere to exist between her and myself or with any other family member or even for even a short while. He doesn't allow me to be, uh, to be comfortable if I'm, I have a difficulty with someone else, if there's tension somewhere else. He does not give me any rest. And he troubles my mind until I put away my pride and resolve it. We cannot allow the devil to steal our joy by ignoring the Holy Spirit and allowing a situation to continue and deteriorate our relationships. No, that dishonors our Savior and creates pain and sorrow for those who love us and whom we love. If we do so, we rob ourselves of the joy that God wants for us in our relationships. The good news is that the Holy Spirit is carrying out the work of Elijah and John the Baptist to bring about the restoration of families, to heal broken homes, to renew relationships between husbands and wives, parents and children, between siblings. And it does not matter how far your relationships have faltered or are broken. If there is a willingness of each person involved, God promises to restore it. But first, he needs to restore you and me to himself. Only then can healing in the family be achieved. It must begin with you and with me. Don't wait on anywhere, anyone else. You can begin now. Won't you pledge with me right now 
to submit yourself to God. Praying that he will forgive you when you have not been a spiritual person and you have fallen victim to the devil's whims that left you difficult to live with. Selfish, proud, stubborn, or even rebellious. I'm happy to let you know that our Father is willing to forgive you, to accept your repentance and give you his spirit. So pray for his spirit to help you seek him as the center of your reference so that you may relate to other family members from a perspective of how Jesus sees them. Pray that he will fulfill his promise to pour his love into your heart so that you can love like how he loves, so that you can be the start of the restoration and renewal of all your family members. Pray this today, that God will bless you in this. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that through Jesus Christ we can be restored to you. As we humble ourselves, as we pray for your Holy Spirit every day, let the presence and power of your Holy Spirit come on us so we may be restored, Father, to right relationships in our families, being quick to love, being quick to acknowledge our faults and to ask for forgiveness, and also being quick to give forgiveness. For those who are hearing for the first time of the great love you have for them, let reassure them, Father, that as they sense your, your goodness and your willingness to forgive them of all their sins, that as they ask you, that you will, you'll forgive them and you'll give them a new heart and new life within them because you forgive them of all their sins. May your blessings be with each of us now. In the name of Jesus, amen.